we're working through some parables. This one, um, this one sometimes is, it's not referred to as a parable, but, um, but in a lot of lists it is. I think it's extremely important. It's something we probably need to cover a lot. And there's a lot of teaching in here. And there's um, some really valuable lessons for the church in these few little verses here. Um, and I just want to give you the background because sometimes this is, uh, when it's lifted out, it kind of loses some of its uh, some of its impactfulness when it's pulled out of where it is in the scripture. So we're in we're in Matthew five, and the beginning in Matthew five. If you know your Bible, that's the Sermon on the Mount. So we have the Beatitudes, and the, and Jesus gives the greatest sermon ever given. He sits and he teaches, and he talks about the Beatitudes, and these are the characteristics of people in heaven, heavenly creatures and. So these are, the, these are the characteristics of Christians. If you want to understand what a characteristic of Christ's followers looks like, read the Beatitudes. And he turns the world upside down. And instead of saying the powerful are those who flex their muscles, they squash the small, and they roll on, and they take what they want. You know, that's kind of what we teach nowadays, right? Um, this, is, this is, you know, be thankful for the peacemakers. Those who are mourning will be comforted. And it's a loving, it's a loving gospel. And you have a loving Savior. Amen. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ is a loving Savior? And we have this, we have these impactful verses who kind of just turn the world upside down on its ear. And then immediately after that, we have these scriptures. So they're probably pretty important scriptures, aren't they? I mean, it's at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, these are mandates given to the church and given to Christians. And sometimes we just kind of look at it as, you know, these are pretty good teachings. This is, this is a mandate given by Christ, all right? And just coming after the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount just gives it its impactfulness. So I just want to pull that up and make sure that we remind ourselves where this is found. And, and it is a very impactful statement here, and I think it's got some great teaching, okay? So this is the salt and the light of the earth. In Matthew 13, immediately after the Beatitudes, he goes in and he says... You, we, okay, so he's talking to Christians, he's talking to, to the followers, you, you are the salt of the earth, but if that salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot by men. This is pretty, some pretty strict language, pretty crude language, you know, pretty impactful language, and it's telling us that we are to be the salt of the world, and if you're not the salt of the world, if you're not... You know, if you're not impacting, making a flavor of the world, then you're pretty useless. You know, Christ, Christ didn't cut any, he, you know, he, he didn't cut any slack here. And when he taught, he taught, and I think, I think we're in a, you know, you can fire me or whatever. I'm going to say this, okay? I think we're, where we are in the world is because we've been given too much slack, amen? <laughs> there wasn't that much slack around my house. My mom didn't give me much slack like that when I was growing up, so <laughs> but I think we're giving a lot, I give them, think we're giving too much slack, and what's the, you know, give enough rope and what happens, right? And I think that's where we were, we are, right? So, so let's just look here at some teaching, okay? He's talking about salt, all right? Salt was a very precious commodity back in that day. It wasn't easy to come by, and, uh, you know, either... They took salt out of, the, out of the ocean, let the water evaporate out of it, or it went through a, you know, a, a purification process where they got it out and then they kind of they melted it down into what they called salt. And uh, um, nowadays, and I think this is a statement of where we are as a world is, um, back then it was a precious commodity. Now, you know, little salt packets come for free, you know, and we just... You ever eaten with Kevin Oglesby? He'd get splattered by the salt when that dude eats. <laughs> I mean, he'd just thrown it around. And so, I mean, we, and, and here's what it is. And this is, this is the devil. He, he's a master at this. What is precious, what's he make it? So common that we throw it out, right? And we've done that with life. We've done that with lives. We've done that with people, with French. Amen? I mean, my goodness. That's, he's a genius at that, and he, what he takes is some of the most precious stuff, commodities of this world, and he makes it to us so common that we don't even think about getting rid of it, OK? 
okay? And there's trouble in that as well, and that's probably why we're in such the fit that we're in now. Amen? In fact, salt was so precious back in this day that Roman soldiers were actually paid with salt sometimes. I don't know if you knew that or not. And that's where the saying, worth his salt, that's where that comes from. All right? So salt was precious. Salt was high value. All right? So salt was used back in the day before refrigeration process and all that. And before we had, uh, what is that? Bam! We got all the stuff. Uh, you know, got a cabinet full of garlic and and hot peppers and red cayenne pepper, whatever you want to throw in the meat, it's all there. Sometimes you just throw it all in there, don't you? You got like, you got like a World War II going on. You got, the, you got a German flavor, you got the Italian flavor, you got the French flavor, you just throw it all in there, okay? So it was used to preserve, all right, and it was used to give flavor. Now, I want to say a little something about that, all right, because we Christians are here, and he's telling us that we're the salt. And guess what we're here to do? To preserve the world from rot. How are we doing? Huh? I mean, it's a nasty world, and we're overmatched sometimes. But we got the greatest force ever. I mean, we got the most powerful force ever on our side, right? And I think sometimes we don't use it to our full ability, do we? Okay? And then the other thing is... Uh, add flavor. And I think sometimes as Christians, we can kind of lose our flavor a little bit. I mean, you don't have to be like so holy that no one wants to be around you, right? I mean, there's a lot to be lived in this life. And I, I'm just telling you, um, you know, um, January and February this year, my goodness, there were days I thought, am I, am I going to make it to the end of this year? I can't even get out of bed. I, and, and I'm just telling you, I've had too much time robbed from me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have fun. I'm going to let the world know that being a Christian, being a Christian is fun. It's great, and it adds flavor to the world. Amen. And you know why I'm going to do that? It's because the Bible tells me that right there, to add flavor. Huh? So I think sometimes we kind of lose that where we think we need to make an impact on people, but we need to first be friends. I mean, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. John, when he writes his gospel, he reveals the humanness of Jesus Christ because you know why? He was best friends with Jesus. I mean, they were best buddies. And we see a human side of Jesus. And we see that, first of all, why was Mary and Martha reaching out to Jesus? Because he was a friend who they loved, and he loved them. And guess what? He could be counted on. So I think that sometimes in the realm of all that's going on in this world, we kind of lose some of the importance of what Christianity is. And I think one of the basic concepts of Christianity is to be a friend, okay? And a friend is someone who loves you and who's, uh, that's, a, that's a word outside the realm of blood family, okay? Your blood family kind of forced to be, right? Mine are up here, so I can't look at them. But, Mom, you got to love me, all right? You're forced to, Okay? But then on, friendship, on a friendship level, that's a different, that's a different word that we use. And in in, that is a word of great importance. And I think one of the best things in this world that you could be other than a Christian, a father, a mother, would be a friend. Because people need, who needs a, who needs a really good friend added to their life? To, I, mean, we all, I mean, we all got, if you've got a, one friend in this world that you can count on, you're blessed. Huh? And you know what? We as Christians, you understand that we need to be friends that can be counted on. I mean, people are going to be broken. I'm broken. I let people down all the time. We're all broken. We're all broken. Amen. And what, and, and what we end up doing is we just start looking down on people. And I don't know why. But you know what? We need friendship in this world. And friendship is the basis of family. You know why a family operates happiness? Because they are friends. And they like each other and they get along. Yeah, you're going to spout or spat and you're going to have your tugs and all that, tug of wars and all that stuff going on. But at the end of it, a family that thrives is a family that loves each other and likes each other. And when you, that happens by choice, by the way. Love is a choice. Okay? And thank God it is a choice because I'm unlovable. And if I wasn't, if it wasn't a choice, there's probably a chance that maybe somebody didn't love me. Okay? But Jesus Christ loved me. He went to the cross for all of us. You know why? Because he chose to, and he took that on. Okay, so not only are we here to preserve the world from rot, but we're also here to give it flavor. And I think one of the basic elements that we're missing right now is friendship. 
all right? And then um, he just shoots you straight. If, if you're not living up to the mandate given into these scriptures, he basically says you're worthless to him. Okay, you're just out being trampled on. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad, right? And then he goes on, he says, you are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And just off, and I, I have it on, just excuse me here for a second. I'm going to pull it up. I have it on my phone here real quick. If I can find it. It's a fed. Is a city just nearby here, over 3,000 feet. And so Jesus always in his element teaching and having, you know, illust- you know, like illustrations and things to point at and stuff. Here he is talking, and he's talking about a city on a hill. And then right here in Israel, right nearby, he's probably, I, it doesn't say that he's pointing, but I'm, I'm sure he was referring because Jesus is always placing things in people's mind that are very practical and it gives real life application to them. And so as he's talking about this, you know, I'm sure they're thinking, well, just right over there is the highest city in Israel, 3,000 feet. So they're getting that into their head, all right? And he says, you cannot hide that city, right? It's up there on the hill. And he refers to us. Think about that. He refers to us as what? The light of the world, city on a hill, right? What does he refer to himself as? The light of the world, right? So what's that tell you? And we talked about this in Sunday school too. To be in Christ, what has to happen? Christ is in you. All right? To reveal Christ, what has to happen? He has to live through you. In order for us to be a light bearer, guess what we have to do? We have to bear the light of the light of the world. Okay? And so the darkness is out there, and it's plentiful. And let me just say that it's plentiful to the point that it's almost a dark, deep, dark world. But there is a light that can shine and outshine any darkness on this world, and that is Jesus Christ. And you know how he's going to shine? Through us, right? Through us, through the church. And that's what happens here. And I think sometimes we lose that, we lose that thought. And I know that we don't you know, intentionally lose it, but sometimes we lose and we get bared down with our own stuff. I get it. I'm there with you. Okay? Trust me. I'm there with you. But in order if we're going to make a difference in this world, we have to reveal the light, all right? And the light is Jesus Christ, and he has to live through us. We have to reveal through him, all right? And this is a statement. It's not a suggestion. He's telling you who you are. You're the light of the world, and you're bearing the light, and that is Jesus Christ. And it is an amazing statement because he referred to himself as the light of the world. And if we are to give light, guess what we have to do? Receive light. If Christ is going to be in us, then we have to be in Christ. And we have to be his disciple. We have to take in his teaching. And guess what his teachings are? They're not always so easy. If you go up to those first couple of verses, there they are. Okay? You have to be thankful when people talk bad about you and lie about you and say awful things about you. You have to be consider yourself blessed. That's hard to do sometimes, right? You have to love your brother and your neighbor who you may not like as yourself. Pretty powerful statement, right? But that's the teaching of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're supposed to reveal. All right? And I think sometimes we get too enclosed and we just keep it to ourselves. This is not, this is not a secret religion. Okay? This is a religion. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But that relationship gets exposed as he lives through us. John reveals to it as a fountain that gives everlasting spring, everlasting water. Ask yourself, anybody around you getting wet from the water that's flowing through you? That'd be a good question to ask yourself as Jesus lives through us, right? And it's needed. We, is there even an argument that we need more light in this world? No? Am I losing you guys? Amen? Matthew 15, 515, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. One thing I want to point out is it gives light to all. It gives light to all. Guess what? We don't get to pick and choose who we love. We don't get to pick and choose who we impact, who we serve. Guess what? We serve and love who Jesus places in our lives. Sometimes they don't like that. 
And guess what? It's not an option. We choose to love because Jesus chose to love us. Amen? Okay, that's the gospel right there. And then we're not to hide this thing. We're to put it on a lampstand. So what's that say? Live it. Live it. Let your light shine. How to earn a bachelor? No. Am I right? And be a friend. Have fun with it. There's a lot of life to live. Amen? And why do we do this? What's the purpose that we're here? The purpose of everything in our life should be what? To glorify Jesus Christ. And as we glorify Jesus Christ, he places all the glory on God the Father in heaven. Amen? Huh? It's such a simple gospel, but it's sometimes so hard to live, isn't it? Huh? Do you know why? Because the, dark, the world is dark. It's mean. It's a nasty place. The devil steals. The devil is a liar. He's a thief. He's here to take everything good from you. Okay? Do some application here before we close. All right? We have been commissioned at the very beginning. A lot of times we look at the Great Commission at the end. Yeah. His parting words, the Great Commission, right here is the first. Isn't it amazing how he does that? The very beginning, when he's preaching his great sermon, he gives us a commission. And it is what? To add flavor to this world, to be a light bearer, and also to be salt so that we can keep the world from decaying. And how do we do that? As Jesus Christ lives through us and we impact the world around us. Okay? We have been commissioned to be a light of the world because guess what? The world is a dark, nasty place and it needs the light of Jesus Christ. And this is a mandate. It's not a suggestion. And guess what? Here's that line again. Complacency is not an option. This is a team sport and we need everybody on board working their service, working their ministries that God has placed in them to the best of their ability. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Star Church's Sermon. We truly hope that the sermon edified you today and brought you closer to the Lord. For more information about Star Church, visit our website at stargbchurch.com. Once again, that's stargbchurch.com. If you would like to visit our church, our address is 4925 State Road 142, El Dorado, Illinois 62930. We now pray that God will bless you as you enter the mission field and bring his word to the world. And as always, we will see you next time here at Star Church.